All right. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the Immune Deficiency Foundation's Skid Compass Lunch and Learn. Today, we are exploring the topic of chimerism with a panel of experts from the Cal Skid Long-Term Follow-Up Project. My name is Emma Martins, and I'm the Program Manager of Community Health at IDF. On behalf of the Foundation, I'd like to thank you for joining us today for this program. We are excited to host this event for the IDF community. IDF is dedicated to fostering a community empowered by education. We want you to remember that IDF is committed to our community, serving you as a trusted resource through the use of technology and innovation. We are here to give you the tools and information to become empowered and offer you our compassion, understanding, and support to emphasize that you are not alone on your journey. Today's program is part of IDF's regular series of bite-sized programming that will provide diagnosis-specific information and support to our community wherever they may be. Before we begin, I would like to point out a few housekeeping items to keep in mind for the webinar. This afternoon, we are using the Zoom webinar feature. Attendees should be able to see the slides and our panelists and be able to hear our presenter and myself speak. Attendees will not be able to activate their video camera or their microphone. There will be the opportunity for questions after the presentation. You are welcome to submit any questions you have for our presenter as you think of them throughout the session. Please type them in the Q&A box in the control panel on your screen. Please do not include any personal health information as all questions will be anonymous and read aloud. A brief disclaimer. Please remember that information presented during this event is not intended to be a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. We are here today as a trusted source and friend to provide you with information. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider with questions concerning a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay seeking it based on information presented during an educational event. Today's program is offered in partnership with the Cal Skid Long-Term Follow-Up Project. Skid Compass, an educational program of the Immune Deficiency Foundation, was created in 2018 with the purpose of guiding parents, families, and the medical community through the journey of learning about this rare, life-threatening medical condition and find support to navigate the health challenges along the way. All of our Skid Compass resources can be found by visiting www.skidcompass.org. The website offers a robust variety of online and printable materials for anyone eager to learn more about this condition or share information with others. Topics cover every step in a family Skid journey from newborn screening to return home after treatment and everything in between. You can view the website in Spanish, French, German, Portuguese, or Tagalog by clicking on Select a Language in the upper navigation. We also want to highlight our Skid Compass Toolkit, a downloadable summary of the website that you can order for free and print in 12 different languages. And now I am so pleased to introduce our presenters for today. Dr. Ami Shah from Stanford School of Medicine will be moderating, and our panel includes Dr. Mort Cohen from UCSF, Dr. Robertson Parkman from CHLA, and Dr. Kenneth Weinberg from Stanford. Welcome, everybody. Okay. Um, we're really pleased to be asked to um, give this uh, talk this morning for all of you. Um, and as we realized when we were doing this talk that we as a group have to do a better job of teaching you about what chimerism is and what we're talking about. Um, so today what we're gonna do is to give a brief introduction about what chimerisms are from Dr. Weinberg. And then we're gonna do three cases that we hope will simplify some of um, what happens with patients with skid after they have a transplantation. And as I, um, Emma mentioned, I'm really pleased to have three really distinguished people who have been doing transplants for skid for many years um, and who are the world's experts in this particular disease. Um, Dr. Mort Cowan from UCSF, Dr. Robertson Parkman, who is now at Stanford, and Dr. Weinberg, who is also at Stanford. So Dr. Weinberg, will you go ahead and start the conversation about what chimerisms are? Did I lose you? We just okay. need, there you, you go. You're muted. Okay. Okay. There you go. Yeah, no, I know, but I didn't want to be muted. Um, thank, thank you, Ami, and, and thank you for uh, inviting us and helping put this together. 
So I think one of the things that's most daunting is we use this weird word chimerism or chimera, which comes from Greek. And very briefly, a chimera is any person whose body is a mixture of cells that came from both themselves and another individual. So anybody who gets a transplant from someone else is a chimera or in the adjective is chimeric. For example, someone who got a kidney transplant is a chimera of their own cells and their donor kidney. A bone marrow chimera is someone who has their own cells, for example, their skin, their heart, their brain, but in addition has blood forming cells from a transplant donor. So I told you that this word has a Greek origin and I'm gonna show you a horrible looking plaque. So, so on the right, lower right is the uh, is a uh, of this plaque, which is from about 300 BC, um, of a chimera who has the head of a lion, the body of a goat, and the uh, tail of a of a serpent. And you say, "Oh my God, you're saying that our children are monsters," and the, the thing that's very funny about this plaque is that in reality, there's two chimeras on, on there because the hero Bellerophon is riding a chimera himself who is Pegasus, who is a winged horse. So it's not clear that chimera was really a word that was meant to, to suggest something monstrous. This is a particular monster. And we certainly in the era of transplantation do not intend to use the word chimeric as any sort of derogatory term. It isn't. So the, the most important thing we need to understand when, and I'm gonna talk specifically about transplants for SCID, but the principles that we're gonna talk about apply to transplants for all immune deficiencies. These apply to say wiscott aldrich syndrome or X-linked hyper IgM. Um, and that is that when we make a graft of bone marrow, there are both what I call baby cells and other cells that are called grown-up cells. And obviously the cells that we're trying to restore for most patients are the T lymphocytes or T cells. So in a graft, there are going to be various levels on the right of mature T cells. The great advantage of putting them into someone is they can fight an infection soon after transplant. Um, unfortunately, in the, that mix of T cells are going to be some cells from the donor that might also cause graft versus host disease. And for that reason, in people who are getting a, certain types of mismatch transplant, you'll see that we frequently take the T cells out or, or what's called a T cell depleted transplant. And there's various ways of doing this, which were uh, developed by doctors Parkman, Cowan, and others. One of the key things to remember about these mature T cells is they're grown up. They don't have a lifespan that's as long as a younger cell. And therefore, it's very possible that after months or years or even decades, the T cells that were originally put in the graft um, from, uh, from the donor may disappear. They may die out and therefore they won't last as long. On the other hand, in the bone marrow, which is the blood forming organ, there are baby cells, which broadly speaking can be divided into sort of two groups, real babies, which are called the stem cells, and then what we call committed progenitors, which are sort of like teenagers or maybe kindergartners, um, which is that they're further along in development. Um, they generally, unlike a stem cell, don't have the ability to become every type of blood cell. A stem cell is unique because it doesn't just make T cells, it makes every single type of blood cell. And therefore, one of the signs that someone, for example, has a graft of stem cells is that the various blood cells, not just their T cells, are coming from the, are, are coming from the donor. And we have developed molecular ways to tell the difference between donor cells that came from the donor and cells that are your own. The problem with these cells, committed progenitors, I'm sorry, uh, are cells, like I said, that are sort of like teenagers, which is that they're further along in development, but also that means that they're usually more restricted. They can't become every single type of blood cell. So it's sort of like having a teenager that you know is going to either be a, uh, a violinist, a rock and roll drummer, or a music critic, but they're not gonna be a civil engineer, um, as opposed to a stem cell who can become anything. <clears throat> 
So the problem with these cells is that it takes many, many months for them to grow up to become a mature T cell. And on the other hand, unlike mature T cells, because they grow up in the recipient's body, they don't cause graft versus host disease. They, they weren't formed in the donor's body and they know the difference between the don't, between uh, growing up in the person who got the transplant and say, oh yeah, I'm, I'm not supposed to attack this body. I don't, I'm not gonna cause GVHD. And then the most interesting thing about stem, or one of the most interesting things about stem cells is they live a long time. They live the entire life of the recipient and we have reason to believe that transplanted stem cells might even be able to be transplanted from someone who got a transplant to another person. And they could live perhaps 100 years or 150 years. So what is chimerism after transplant for SCID? So first of all, every successfully transplanted child with SCID is a chimera. And now let's talk about some terminology that frequently gets confusing. If all of the blood cells after transplant come from their donor, then the patient is a full chimera or has full donor chimerism. If some of their blood cells come from their donor and others are their own, then they are a mixed chimera or they have mixed chimerism. Whether someone has full or mixed chimerism depends on a lot of different things, but the three major things are what kind of skid did they have? So for example, there are forms of skid in which there may not be any T cells that, that a child was able to make, but they were able to make B cells on their own. Um, and therefore they may end up with B cells after the transplant that are theirs or B cells that are from the donor. It also depends on what medications that they receive before the transplant and that's called conditioning as you know. Um, so even though I think the, a lot of people think of conditioning as well, it's just chemotherapy. In reality, there are different medicines that have different effects on the recipient and affect what kind of chimerism you're gonna have. And the last factor is what type of graft they got with the major determinant being whether we took all the grown up T cells out or whether the graft was unmanipulated, meaning that all of the cells that were in the bone marrow were given. So if we go back to the thing of baby cells and grown-up cells, what does it take to get, make the grown-up cells uh, uh, engraft in a person getting a transplant? Well, in a baby with skid who doesn't have an immune system that can very easily reject the cells, mature T cells in the graft can usually grow sometimes with some conditioning, some medication to suppress the immune system further. Frequently, that I mean, those medications are given because the child may have some cells, uh, may have some immune cells that they got from uh, crossing the placenta because the cells are the mother cells and they cross the placenta. And the examples of the drugs that might be given before transplant that would allow mature T cells to grow are antithymocyclobulin or ATG and fludarabine. Very importantly, neither ATG or fludarabine will get rid of the person's stem cells and they will not allow a stem cell graft by themselves. On the other hand, if we want to get a graft of the stem cells, they need to have space made in the bone marrow because the, space, the bone marrow is occupied by the person's own cells and therefore medication needs to be given before the transplant to make space. And the typical medication that was first developed actually um, by my colleagues with, uh, for this use was busulfan. And since then we've had another drug, triosulfan. And many of you may know that we have been involved, uh, all four of us have been involved in a study of using a monoclonal antibody instead of a chemotherapy drug that helps clear out space in the bone marrow, which is called an anti-kit antibody. And there may be other antibody trials coming up in the future. So a very important question that that, that as, as um, the cases get presented, is you're gonna see that we're gonna describe whether individual patients have T cells, B cells, or NK cells that came from their donor. But a question that you, that you can ask is, do they also have other types of blood cells besides T cells, B cells, or NK cells that came from their donor? Because if they do, that would suggest that they've engrafted with stem cells. So Ami, I'll turn it over to you.
Thank you. That was really great, Ken. Um, so what we're going to do is talk about three different individual patients. And I want to make sure people understand that these are not specific patients that you can always say, I'm that person or I'm a different person. If you have questions about who, what kind of uh, transplant you got or what kind of chemotherapy you got, please go back to your own physician and discuss that if any questions show up about you individually. So patient number one is a seven-month-old male who had X-linked skin. <clears throat> At diagnosis, he had no T cells, which is very typical for X-linked skin. He had 95 B cells, and B cells, as we talked about, are cells that can fight bacteria, and 45 NK cells. Although, um, so he was a T minus, which means no T cells, but he does have B cells and NK cells. He had an unconditioned, um, which means no chemotherapy transplant from his sister at four months of age. At day 100, all of his T cells were his donor, okay? Because he didn't have his own T cells, all of his sister's T cells grew. He had 4% donor chimerism for his B cells. Because he had B cells, there is a mixture of his own, cell, his own B cells and his sister's B cells. And he has 7% chimerism of his NK cells. Okay, so I'm going to ask Dr. Cowan to take the first question. Um, so what does it mean that their T cells are from the donor, but the B and the NK cells are primarily from the recipient? Well, so as you, you kind of said um, already, XKID, is, it, well, it is the most common type of skid that we deal with. And it's usually um, the easiest form of skid to treat with a bone marrow transplant because um, they usually don't reject the donor cells very easily. So they're, they're kind of easy to engraft um, with a transplant. Um, and I'm assuming the sister was HLA matched, uh, yes. meaning tissue matched or perfectly compatible uh, with her brother. Um, and that makes it the ideal donor. So this is kind of the best kind of situation um, for a transplant for, for a skid. So the um, these patients, as Ami said, don't have any T cells. Um, and so um, the cells that uh, the baby's going to get um, following the transplant, uh, the T cells are all going to be from the donor. So that's why you would expect the T cells to be 100% uh, donor um, in this situation. Now, in terms of the B cells, um, the, and, and NK cells, since we didn't give any conditioning or any, we didn't make any space, we didn't give any chemotherapy to make space in the bone marrow, then you would not expect uh, very many, if any, stem cells from the donor to actually engraft. So uh, the baby in this case might be making a few B cells, but most of the B cells that are present are going to be from the, the patient's own B cells that don't function. Uh, now those 4% donor B cells might be able to do, might be able to function. And again, this is just day 100 and uh, this thing may, this may evolve over time, either going up or going down. Um, the NK cells being 7% donor, it's in a way the same situation. This child had a, a low number, but still present uh, NK cells, and since no conditioning was given, um, you might not see very many uh, donor NK cells emerging. So again, you might expect to see a relatively low percent of uh, donor NK. And and I know that um, you know when patients get IVIG or immunoglobulin, it's because they don't oftentimes have enough B cells. Will the lack of donor B cells mean that I will need IVIG? Yeah, so of course, if, if the donor doesn't, if you don't get any donor B cells, then that is correct. Then IVIG is gonna be necessary since even though the B cells are present in the X-linked form of SCID, those B cells aren't able to uh, make antibody or function in, in any way. Um, it is, it's, however, something that at day 100, um, you do need to give it a little bit of time to see how things evolve since uh, 
um, the experience has been that in about 70 plus percent of patients with ex-skid who get a MAT sibling transplant, even without conditioning, um, will develop some B cell immunity over time. And do you think that I would always need an IVIG? And if not, how would I know if I even need IVIG? Well, that's something that will have to be evaluated over time. So, right. you know, as that's one reason why we don't just say goodbye to the patient after 100 days and uh, send them on their way, even if they have good T cells. Um, we do have to follow them and uh, check to see whether they're able to make immunoglobulins. And if they are, whether they can uh, make specific antibody responses. But again, with such a low donor chimerism, I'd be a little concerned or uh, pessimistic about whether uh, B cell immunity is going to recover. But that, that can, it, it, it takes time. It can take a year or two before you really know whether B cell immunity is going to re be restored. And, and what Dr. Cowan also highlighted as a really important fact for patients with SCID is that long-term follow-up is really important for these patients to continually monitor that chimerism so we know if the stem cells continue to grow or do we just have a mature T cell graft. Um, and we also need to monitor their immunity long-term because patients aren't just transplanted and then go away. We wanna make sure we continue to follow these patients to make sure that we're doing the best for preventing them from getting infections. So patient number two is a six month old child with Omen syndrome. And some of you have had Omen syndrome and many of you may not have had Omen syndrome. Um, and Omen syndrome is a, is a type of skid in which they have autoreactive T cells, which means they have their own T cells that are fighting themselves as well. At birth, he had 691 T cells, which were all from himself. He had no B cells and he only had a small little number of NK cells. He went to transplant very quickly. He received a ke only chemotherapy with busulfan and cytoxan and followed by a T cell depleted haploidentical transplant from his father. Um, at day 100, he had mixed chimerism. 60% of the cells were of his own, which is the patient, and 40% of the cells were of his father. What we oftentimes do now, um, many, many years ago, when I first started this, we really just did whole blood. We just took the whole blood and said, how many cells are the donors and how many cells are the patients? Um, and now we have the ability to see how many cells of, are mixed of the T cells, of the B cells, of the NK cells, and of the whole white blood cells, et cetera. So in this particular situation, 90% of the T cells were of his own and 10% of the donors. 100% of the B cells were of the donor and 100% of the NK cells were of the donor. And Dr. Parkman, in this situation, that when, when most of the T cells are of the recipient of the patient, but the B and the NK cells are of the donor. What, what do you think that means? So this is a case where, unlike the X-linked skid that Dr. Collins spoke about, that the recipient, the patient had no ability to make any T cells. Unfortunately, this person can actually make some T cells and that process is defective. In normal individuals, there are no T cells circulating in you that can attack yourself unless you have an autoimmune disease. In this disease, unfortunately, all the circulating cells that occur uh, are autoreactive. And most of the time when these children are born, they actually look like they have what's called graft-versus-host disease. But rather than the patient being attacked by the cells from the donor, as Dr. Weinberg talked about, they're being attacked by their own cells. And so therefore, um, this patient was given a drug cyclophosphamide in an attempt to kill off all of the existing recipient T cells that were attacking recipient. Uh, we were also given busulfan to create, quote, the space for the donor hematopoietic stem cells to engraft. So this result means that the busulfan was successful in eliminating the hematopoietic stem cells of the recipient so the donor cells can uh, engraft. But the persistence of large numbers of the recipient T cells means that the dose of cytoxin was inadequate in getting rid of all of the cells. 
And my prediction would be that this child would continue to have um, what would appear to be clinical graft versus host disease and would be continued to have an attack of the recipient cells against himself because he was not adequately immunosuppressed. And in this case, not only immunosuppressed, immunoblated, that is to say, we want to eliminate all the pre-existing recipient T cells. So my predict, oh, go ahead, Dr. Shaw. Oh, go ahead, you're finish, right. sorry. <laughs> so my prediction would be is this child would probably receive a second transplant and the second transplant would be focused primarily on increasing the immunosuppression. And as Dr. Weinberg mentioned, uh, there are other drugs like the antithymocyte globulin or fludarabine that could be given. Uh, and it's most likely that a second transplant would have those drugs as quote, the conditioning, because again, the goal would be to ablate all the pre-existing recipient T cells so that now uh, the donor stem cells can grow up and at, at, after the second transplant with the goal of having 100% of the T cells being of donor origin. And, and that's that's great, thanks. So my other question then for you, Dr. Um, Parkman would be that is, any, is there any alternative to doing a second transplant if you don't have, if you don't come back after a transplant with T cells of the donor? As I said, that the, the goal is to ablate the, um, the, 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 the continued presence of the recipient T cells. Theoretically, because you have a stem cell graft from the donor, you could try to immunosuppress or immunoblate the recipient and not do a repeat transplant, saying that those drugs, the ATG and the fludarabine, would not negatively infect the newly engrafted hematopoietic stem cells with the, with the goal of now letting the person reconstitute from their engrafted uh, stem cells. And so it would be reasonable to only do uh, immunoablation without a second transplant as an alternative approach. Right. And, and it's really important what Dr. Um, Parkman was saying is that these patients without having um, donor T cells, will may still have graft versus host disease and graft versus host disease in and of itself will also suppress your immune system. Our goal when we do transplant is so that you have a normal functional immune system after transplant. Um, Obviously, that helps you get rid of any kind of infection. So having graft versus host disease will not help that situation down the road. And I want to open that up. Does anybody else, um, Dr. Cowan or Dr. Weinberg, have any other thoughts on this particular patient? No. Okay. That I, think, I think that's likely this patient actually has a pretty good prognosis ultimately, because the fact is they do have a stem cell graft. And so therefore, if you can just get rid of the other, the other T cells um, that shouldn't be there, uh, the likelihood is that, that the uh, bone marrow will start making donor cells and be, allow recovery. Yeah, I, I think the issue also was that uh, this child received a, a haplocompatible or half match transplant from, I think his father, mm -hmm. the cells were T cell depleted, the donor cells. So there was really nothing, no, no donor T cells were uh, present. And probably maybe that also contributed to the fact that the um, T cells from the patient, these auto reactive T cells were able to, to persist. So, you could consider, I, I think one, you know, the, an alternative that uh, Dr. Parkman mentioned of uh, just giving, uh, trying to ablate those T cells and then allow this, the donor stem cells to reconstitute T cell immunity is certainly uh, one way to go. And another would be to do that same approach, but give a small number of um, donor T cells um, back to the patient to at least restore T cell immunity temporarily until those stem cells start to reconstitute. There's, there's many different ways of approaching these patients and it really depends on the situation at the time. And the most important thing is that if this situation does happen for you as a patient or as a family, um, having a long conversation with your physician and going through all the different options that are available um, and really understanding 
what those cells that you currently have are and what that means long term. Okay. Patient number three is a nine-month-old male um, who was initially diagnosed after an RSV infection, which is a bad viral infection. Um, he was quite sick at the time he was diagnosed. He was found to have ex-skid, but was not diagnosed from the newborn screening, so which is why he was infected at the time of, um, of diagnosis. Um, this was the case before we had newborn screening. Now that we have newborn screening, most of our patients come to us before a couple of months of age, and we're actually able to keep them protected and isolated so they don't get a serious infection. Not everybody. In this particular situation, though, um, he didn't get picked up on the newborn screening and he was diagnosed after a bad infection. His initial testing showed that he was maternally engrafted. Maternally engrafted means that his some of his mom's T cells mixed in his blood in utero, and he um, ended up having... Um, his mom's cells in his body, which can cause a rash oftentimes early on. Because of his organ function, in the sense that with his RSV infection, he was had required oxygen. He had a lot of um, pneumonias in his lungs. Um, he had been on a ventilator for a short period of time. As a result of that organ function, he received what's called a reduced conditioning regimen of low dose busulfan. Okay, it was not an ablative dose of busulfan, but a lower dose. Um, he received a low dose of fludarabine, and he did not receive any um, serotherapy, which means the ATG or the fludar, or sorry, he, any other serotherapy such as ATG um, coming into transplantation. At day 100, his T cell chimerism was 100% donor T cells. His B cell chimerisms were 80% donor chimerism. And his NK cells were 90% donor chimerism. He did have stem cells present in his, um, in his, at day 100. At one year, his stem cell chimerism was 70% donor and 30% recipient. He had a T cell count though of 43, which is quite low. Normally at one year, we would expect to have several hundred T cells. Normal T cell number is about a thousand or above. Um, and he obviously at 43 is a quite low number. B cells he had of 85, which is okay. And his NK cell number was 140. And these are absolute numbers. So Dr. Weinberg, what does it mean that 70% of the cells are from the donor? So, so presumably um, the 70% of the cells, remember we talked before about that if you have other types of blood cells besides T cells, B cells, or NK cells, such as the granulocytes or the, or the neutrophils, whatever word you want to use to describe them, if they're coming from the donor, that means that a certain percentage of the bone marrow is made of the donor's stem cells. And in this case, it's likely that it's in the range of 70%. So this person, this child has gotten a, um, a graft of stem cells from their donor, which presumably would allow them to keep on giving uh, rise to T cells, B cells, and K cells, as well as all the other blood cells, although some of the cells that, that that are gonna be made are still gonna be abnormal immune cells because they're actually ex-skid cells. Why do you think the T cell numbers are so low at this point? And what will that mean long-term? It, it's not clear. So I think one of the, re, the, there are a couple issues that come up. So, and, and in fact, we didn't describe who the donor was. I know, I realized that after I wrote this, after I presented, I was like, whoops, I didn't put so this on. I'm assuming it was a T cell depleted graft. It was a T cell depleted graft from the mom. <laughs> so as Dr. Cowan just referred to in the previous um, case, one of the issues when we take the T cells out of a graft, it means that we're not really transferring um, many grown up T cells from the donor um, that may only live again, months or years. So if you remember at 
early after the transplant, a lot of the T cells were from the donor, but that that has gone down over time. And that would strongly suggest that the T cells that were in the graft have basically been depleted and that any new T cells that are going to be, that are going to be there are going to have to come from the stem cells and engrafted. And so the, the other factor is that, as I talked about, it takes a long time for stem cells to become T cells. Um, any, anywhere from months in, in adults, it can take as long as two or three years after transplant. Fortunately, kids' um, immune systems develop faster, and it should have been something that, say, at one year, you would, you would see evidence of T cells that are there. My concern is that this child may have, and, and we didn't say, I assume we're saying there's no maternal T cells left behind. Correct. No maternal okay. T cells. Um, the, so the other concern that this raises, is it possible that as a result of the maternal T cells having been there um, in the first months of life, that the T cell environment, the thymus, where T cells normally uh, develop, has been damaged by graft versus host disease from those maternal T cells, and that it's just going to take a very long time to make new T cells? And, and at what point would you say, would you think, oh my gosh, the T cells aren't growing well, I need to do something else? So we have a test that allows us to not just talk about T cells, but to talk about whether new T cells are being made. And I think a fundamental question for this child right now is what evidence do we have that the child is actually making T cells? Because if in fact he's not making T cells uh, very much, it would suggest the possibility that in fact the thymus has been damaged. And the choices that will have to be made are, do we think that that's going to get better over time? Um, in which case we say, well, let's try to support um, the child by providing uh, other forms of protection from infection, such as intravenous immunoglobulin and try to wait it out versus say, no, I'm sorry, I just don't think the cells are gonna grow. And then we need to think about doing another transplant. And the problem with that is that's gonna further damage the thymus. Right. So, so this is a this is a very this is a very tough situation to me. I don't think there's a right decision. Um, and there's information that needs to be obtained. Um, and a lot of conferring uh, among both family and uh, and the care team about, well, what makes the most sense? I certainly would probably be in favor of trying to wait it out for a while. Yeah, and Dr. Cowan and Dr. Parkman, do you have any other thoughts on this particular situation? It's a tough one. <laughs> I'm glad that Dr. Weinberg got this patient. <laughs> This one is the most difficult yeah. of all of them. And first of all, I would say I wouldn't wait a year with a T cell count of 43. I mean, I, I think something needs to be done if they're to, for this child as soon as possible. But possibly, you know, I think it, it is a problem if this happened to be GVH that has damaged the thymus. Um, it does make the possible approaches more limited. Um, the other possibility I was thinking of is uh, some type of chronic infection that could lead to, lead to T cell exhaustion. Very important. So I would certainly want to know, you know, chronic CMV or adenovirus or any number of infections could, could possibly result in this. Um, and I'm assuming that the cells, the different lineages, the chimerism in the T cells, B cells, and NK cells we know already? I mean... Uh, I, did I not put that in there? Okay. Um, I just said 43. Okay. No, they're low. But they're anyway, low. Yeah. Like Dr. Wine, Wine, uh, Bert said, we need, um, we need to know more about this patient. This patient's in trouble. Mm -hmm. And... I mean, and I guess the other theoretic, and I want theoretic in large letters, would be the issue of trying to do a thymus transplant. If, if, if the di if 
as the test that Dr. Weinberg did, where it showed that there was no production of new T cells and that this small numbers were left over from what came in the graft and that there was no capacity to make new T cells. That would mean that child in certain ways was like being a DeGeorge syndrome. And the question would then would be whether a thymus transplant to give some thymic tissue would be a, 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 an option. And, just and I think one of the things that this case really illustrates is that when patients do well, they do really well. Um, when patients have mixed chimerism um, at very, very at good levels with the majority of them still being from the donor, we probably are okay. We may need to give a few more medications, but we're probably okay. But when we have a very low number of immune reconstitution and we have a low chimerism, that's when we really have to jump in and think about what to do, what's best for the patient. And there's several factors on that particular patient that will contribute to how we make that decision. What did they get for their chemotherapy? What are they do? Are they infected? Um, many of them can are at risk of getting infections, and we have to think through that. And do they have any graft versus host disease? And that's why the answers sometimes in patients that are very complicated like this are not so easy. And we oftentimes, as a group of patients that people that take care of skid patients, we oftentimes work with our colleagues across the country together to think through what are some of the best options that are available. Um, Everybody here on the call is also able to talk through things with, with your physicians in terms of what are some other better options that might be available. Um, and so it, there's not a one size fits all for patients when they have this degree of low chimerism. I was just gonna relay the testing that we were talking about to what this audience already knows about, which is that what we say we wanna to look to see is the patient making new T cells. It's the same exact test that's used in newborn screening or the TREC test, uh, which allows us to determine whether or not the T cells that are there have been newly made, meaning they're coming from the stem cells. And there are other versions of looking for that that depend on antibody staining of the cells that don't that aren't that that are also quick turnaround um, that are equivalent to doing the TREC test. So this is a test that you're all familiar with um, as a way of measuring new T cell production. But we're saying that it may be necessary to do that after transplant, not just as a diagnostic tool. I want to make one comment about the first case that was presented. That when Dr. Weinberg talked, he talked about in the transplant inoculum, there are both stem cells, the baby cells, and adolescent cells, the progenitors. Those progenitors can give rise to both lymphocytes as well as myeloid cells. And so one of the points is when you have small degrees of, of donor cells, as in the first case, it may not actually represent stem cell engraftment, may just represent that you put in progenitors. And for a limited period of time, because these cells are not self-renewing, you can have donor cells. And so only with time will you know that that seven to 4% in the first patient really were, represents stem cell engraftment as opposed to just donor progenitor cells that made their progeny for uh, uh, maybe up to a year. Yes, that's a very uh, good point. That's a, that's a good point, um, Robbie. The, and I think, uh, again, that's why the day 100 is, is early. It gives you a little bit of an idea of what's going on, but really things mature over time and, you know, probably one year and even two years, sometimes um, things are, haven't yet um, leveled out. And this highlights the importance of having long-term follow-up at your, <clears throat> either at your transplant institution or where you are locally, just so that we can monitor what your immune system is going to do and what that level of chimerism looks like. Um, uh, and so in conclusion, um, chimerism's and what they mean can be very complicated after a transplant and depend on many factors. The genotype, the type of skid that you have, whether it's an X-linked skid or a RAG1 versus many, the many hundreds of different types of skid uh, mutations that we've now identified. It also depends on the conditioning regimen that you receive, whether it was myeloablative, which means full heavy doses of chemotherapy versus a reduced intensity versus no chemotherapy, which some kids with skid still get. And obviously, infections that you had prior to transplant 
also contribute to how we transplant you and what else, what other conditions may be going on, as well as graft versus host disease or maternal engraftment that you had prior to transplant. It's important that if you don't understand what your chimerisms mean, that you really go through and ask your doctor to really explain them to you. Um, it's important, you know, sometimes as physicians, we, we will say words and we think you may understand, and maybe you don't, and it's okay to ask. I think that's why we're all do in this field is our best way of taking care of you guys as patients is for making sure you understand the importance of what your test results mean so that you can make informed decisions and you know what your restrictions may be and what you can and cannot do. Um, and so this is important for you short-term and long-term. And some of you on the call may have actually had a transplant many years ago and are now adults. So you weren't actually privy to all this information when you were a baby. Um, but it's really important as you become an adult <clears throat> that you think through what is what is going on with me now? What did I have and where am I now? And what does that mean for me long term? Um, we, we certainly hope that this has been very helpful for you guys. Um, and, um, you know, we put all of our emails here in case you guys have questions that you want to ask any of us. We're happy to answer them. Um, but obviously your physicians are the most important people. And I will stop sharing, Emma, and I see that you have some probably questions. <clears throat> yes, wonderful. Thank you so much to each of you. Um, that was a wonderful presentation. And yeah, we have some great questions lined up. So now we are going to go ahead and dive into the Q&A. Um, again, my name is Emma Mertens. I'm the Program Manager of Community Health here at IDF. And leading us through the Q&A, we have Dr. Ami Shah, Dr. Mort Cowan, Dr. Robertson Parkman, and Dr. Kenneth Weinberg. Um, a friendly reminder that if you do have a question you'd like to ask, so please put your question in the Q&A box at the bottom of your Zoom screen. All right, first question. So this individual asks, I just want to make sure I understand the slide about N and NK cells in, in chimerism. If we are farther along in years post-transplant, did I understand the gist was it will matter how many donor B and NK cells exist in order to protect um, when already mixed with host donor B and NK cells? Is there a healthy balance or percentage that should exist. Um, for example, below 50% is concerning or some sort of measure like that. And I think this is just anyone's game. I mean, I think that um, <clears throat> there's several factors that go into what that percentage means. Do you have a stem cell graft? How many T cells do you actually have? Um, if you have a decent number of T cells that are enough to protect you, that's then you may not need to do anything further. Are you have making new T cells or these old T cells, just mature T cells that are decreasing over time? Um, so I'm not sure that I can answer specifically a percentage for each individual patient versus what does that immune system and what are those stem cells making? <clears throat> I think B cells are a little harder. Um, and, and for all of these, you really need to know, especially for B cells, B cells can be present as we know in XGID and yet not function, not make specific antibody. Um, and so I think for any uh, post-transplant patient, um, even no matter what the B cell numbers are, um, if they do have some donor B cells, and I don't know if any of us know what the percent needs to be, you need to check to see whether they function. And one way to determine that is to look for the development of immunoglobulins. These are the proteins in the blood that make uh, specific antibodies. So IgM and IgA are very important uh, to measure, IgM in particular. Um, IgG is not a good measure because patients like this are on gamma globulin, which is predominantly IgG. So you can't really tell um, whether they're making specific antibodies or not uh, from that standpoint um, by just looking at the IgG level. But IgM, you can look at, and then you can uh, uh, vaccinate patients. Again, you have to take them off, generally have to take them off the gamma globulin for a few months to allow that IgG to disappear. Uh, from the body, but then you can immunize patients and determine whether they're able to make specific antibody. 
but I don't I don't know of any you know percent uh, and certainly uh, or even an absolute number uh, that you need. We, more recently, a year, a year and a half ago, uh, before antibodies to COVID was in the general population, one of the ways to answer this question would have been to give the person uh, a, a COVID vaccination. Uh, since the replacement immunoglobulin didn't have any antibody, if an antibody appeared in the patient, it would mean that their endogenous B cells and T cells were able to make antibodies. Unfortunately, that no longer is a way of addressing the question uh, that, that Dr. Cowan has raised. Yeah. The other way we do is, is um, we can measure uh, natural antibodies that are IgM antibodies that are called isohemagglutinin titers, and they're isohemagglutinins, and they're antibodies that are made to red cell antigens. If you're blood type A or blood type B or blood type O, then you're going to be making uh, antibodies to the other. Like if you're A, then you'll make anti-B. And if you're B, then you'll make anti-A. And these things can be measured very easily in any blood bank. So um, that's another thing that you can use to get a sense as to whether um, B cell immunity is, is uh, returning. So just to summarize the answer, the person was asking about, is there a threshold percentage that has to be donor? And I think what everyone is saying is that you really need to look at the function of the cells, not just what the percentage is. And so what that means is a chimerism is only one test among several that we would use to make to try to understand what sort of support someone needs or whether they need any uh, additional uh, transplant therapy. Get to next question. Wonderful, thank you, everyone. That was great. All right, next question. This individual is asking: Is it normal many years post transplant to still have below normal levels of abs absolute lymphocytes? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, and 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 I just want to be very clear. So, you know, we're focused on primary immune deficiency, but the reality is, is if we look at people who got transplants for other diseases, um say leukemia, it is very common that a year, two, three years after transplant, the numbers are not normal. And I can't say that I really understand why. I would say if you look at that, the good thing is the immune system has a lot of built-in redundancy. That is to say, there's a lot more than what you need. So what we call normal may not be the same thing as what's the minimum number you need to get along. And again, as, as the other people have said, the answer to the question is how well do the cells that you have work rather than just looking purely at quote, the number. And I think the other thing about that is that <clears throat> you're at saying many years post-transplant, it depends on what type of transplant they got. If they got an unconditioned transplant, they may have just gotten mature T cells that may be, that have a lifespan at some point. We don't know what that lifespan is. And so, and, and even when we get older as human beings, like in myself, my numbers of lymphocytes may go down as I get older because they're going to get exhausted. So there's a lot of questions that go into that particular question, that particular answer. Um, but not everybody will have a normal set of absolute lymphocytes after transplantation. Uh -huh. for a variety of reasons. I would just add that... that um a point that we should have probably made, or I should have made before, is that um, without conditioning and these unconditioned transplants where uh, we're not getting a whole lot, if any, stem cells um, in grafting, that some patients will um, tend to, to decrease or lose some of their immunity over time. Um, and sometimes, and this can be at five, 10 years, um, or even longer, and sometimes they may need additional therapy in order to boost their immune system um, or restore their immunity. So it's another reason why um, long-term follow-up is really essential for patients who've gotten a transplant for SCID, and probably for almost any disease. Thank you all.
All right, next question. This individual asks, um, you brought up with patient number two, the terms immune suppression and immune ablation. Can you please explain the difference between the two and give examples? Also, if you give immune ablation, how long do you wait to see if it works before you decide to transplant again? So it's a matter of degree. Immunosuppression would mean that you would like to reduce the number of T cells in that example to maybe 90% of what they were to start with, but, you're, but you are willing to accept there are some left over. Immune ablation means that you eliminate all of the detectable cells. So, it, so it's a matter of degree, and which probably relates to the, the, the number and the amount of the drugs that you give. As I mentioned, I think in the last case, the person received uh, a reduced intensity regime, that I, not a full dose of busulfan. So if, if you want to immunosuppress, you give one set of doses. If you want to give immun immunoablation, you give a larger set of uh, uh, doses. And that you can track by following this. And basically that you're talking about the drugs that you would give right before a transplant. So in a sense, if you were going to do a repeat transplant, you would do the transplant basically two to three days after you, you stop giving uh, the drugs that you were giving for immune ablation. Wonderful, thank you. All right, two more questions to get through. The next question, what is the difference between chemotherapy and serotherapy? And can you please provide examples? Sure, so, so chemotherapy refers to medications that are usually um, uh, drugs that have been synthesized for specific purposes. Um, uh, um, and the examples would be cyclophosphamide is a chemotherapy drug. Serotherapy refers to drugs that are um, based on being an antibody. So antithymocyte globulin, which is made by basically immunizing um, bunnies or horses with human uh, T cells is an example of serotherapy, serum. Um, another form of serotherapy would be the drug Campath, which is a monoclonal antibody um, uh, that is directed against all immune cells and, is, and has been incorporated into some transplant regimens. Chemotherapy generally refers to, as I said, drugs that mostly have been synthesized, and they include things like cyclophosphamide, busulfan, triosulfan, um, those are all examples of chemotherapy drugs. Um, in general, serotherapy drugs have less long-term side effects and risks um, than chemotherapy drugs, where we think about the long-term complications of giving chemotherapy, such as a risk of um, uh, endocrine disorders like growth, uh, growth hormone failure or an increased risk of developing cancer, those things do not, are not complications of serotherapy. Wonderful, thanks, Dr. Weinberg. All right, and our final question, are there long-term complications for having mixed B-cell chimerisms? Um. I think the only thing, and we've kind of alluded to this, when you have mixed chimerism of your B cells, it depends on if you're making B cells or not. Um, are you make, able to make immunoglobulin? Um, the, al the alternative is, is that patients, some patients may have to be on IVIG replacement for a very long period of time, maybe even indefinitely. Other than that, um, there's not really a specific long-term organ complication, but it's not ideal for patients to have to be on IVIG forever, although um, there are patients out there that that's what they're on and they're still leading normally functional lives. They just have to get still some medication replacement. Wonderful. Thank you so much to our panelists. And with that, we will wrap up the Q&A. And um, I know everyone on our panel is very busy. I just have a couple more slides to get through, but if you guys need to leave, that is totally fine. Um, I'm sure you have busy days to get to. Um, but just wanted to say before you do leave, thank you so much to this wonderful panel. We really appreciate you lending your time and expertise to us today. Um, and I know that this was very beneficial for our audience. So thank you so much.
All right, we hope you'll remember to take advantage of all of the resources that IDF has to offer. Um, if you had another question that you didn't get to ask during the Q&A, you can go online and submit your question to Ask IDF. Uh, just visit www.primaryimmune.org slash ask-idf or give us a call at the 800 number on your screen. <clears throat> We want to make sure you check out the IDF Resource Center and YouTube page. That's where you'll find all of our videos, resources, news, and more. And it's a busy spring here at IDF. We have lots of great upcoming programs. <clears throat> We have an in-person PI Foundations program in Atlanta, Georgia this Saturday, um, followed by our next webinar, which will cover PI and neurological issues on Thursday, April 6th, followed by our Walk for PI virtual kickoff on April 12th. And finally, we hope you'll save the date for our 2023 PI conference, which will take place virtually on June 22nd and 23rd. Visit primaryimmune.org conference for more information. Thank you again so much to our wonderful panelists for their time and expertise today. Thank you to our audience for being so engaged and asking great questions. We really appreciate you all taking the time to join us today. Um, and we hope to see you at the next IDF event and hope you have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you so much. Take yeah. care. Thank you. Mm -hmm.